still see eternity in me but you're turning ashes into art because that's just the kind of god you are it's in the empty tomb it's on the rugged cross your death defying love is written in the scars you'll never quit on That's the kind of God you are. You gave me freedom from my sin. You told me I could start again. All I heard is dead and gone. Now we're your daughters and your sons. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. tried to run but still you came and you stepped into the dark because that's just the kind of god you are the miracle you're waiting on feels a million miles away been so strong now you're tired of losing faith but you don't face this alone healing's waiting when you let go fall into the arms of jesus into the arms of grace hang on to his promises when it's more than you can take
Sometimes I feel like a days of stone Like I'm praying for rain but the sky never opens Sometimes I can feel you in my bones Like I could burst into flames at about any moment Sometimes I feel like I can breathe again I could fall, I could rise But I'm still alive Good morning. Welcome to Lake Point. How are you today? Good. We want to invite you to stand and worship with us.
control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is a place where you promise to be.
You may be seated. We're going to prepare for communion. Scripture tells us to examine our hearts before we come to the table. So take a moment and do that. And what that means is just take some time with the Lord and take stock, so to speak, of things in your heart, your life. Maybe you knowingly have unrepented sin, something that you haven't repented for. But it's not a time that you're supposed to dig up the past or dig something up you've already asked forgiveness for. It's not time for guilt. It's not time to, to uh, come up with something. You've already been forgiven. The cross has already happened. It's not the cross plus plan. It's not some action you have to do. You're already forgiven. So it's a time for us to just kind of examine who we are before the Lord, before we come to the table. Just take a moment now. And so we come before you, Lord, with thanksgiving and gratefulness that we are able to come today to the table to remember what you have done for us. For those who are helping to serve communion, if you could go ahead and come up. If you're here for the first time, do not feel that you have to partake in this. Uh, you're more than welcome. Everybody is welcome. Children are welcome as well. We leave that to the discretion of their parents. If you have talked with them and they know what communion is, we leave that up to the parents. We will serve the first rows communion, and then we will call everybody up to come to the aisles, come up to the front, take your elements, go back to your seat, and we will take them all together. Before, though, we serve the front row, we would like to serve those who may have mobility challenges of coming up to the front. We do have a team that will come around to you. You just need to signal to us or someone next to you needs to signal to us that you would like for us to come and give you the elements. We will give those with mobility issues first, then we will give the front rows and then everyone will come together, and we will take all the elements together at the same time. So if you have uh, mobility issues, could you go ahead and just signify to, to someone up here that you'd like us to come back to you?
Scripture tells us that in the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and after giving thanks for it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat of this bread. This is my body broken for you and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is a new covenant of my blood shed for you. Take and drink of it and do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You proclaim the Lord's death, his burial, his resurrection, and his coming again. Come, Lord Jesus, come. At this time, you can pass your cups to the center aisles and our ushers will pick them up. We want to go to a time of prayer. The first Sunday of the month, we like to invite families up for prayer. So if our prayer team could go ahead and come up now and come up to the front. We have elders that are part of this team, as well as people who pray in our church. We want to just pray for you. Just come up one of the aisles, have someone give you a blessing or pray. Maybe you're having surgery or maybe something is going on, or maybe you're just excited and happy that it's 100% humidity outside. Whatever it might be, Go ahead now and come on up and get prayer if you need it.
It's good for the church to be praying, isn't it? I'd like to call all the children up at this time. We're going to pray over our kids before they go to Kids Church today. So if the best kids in the world could come right up front here. Here they come. The strongest, the bravest, the most well-behaved, even when there's no school. For their parents, they listen the first time. That's these kids right here, right, moms and dads? <laughs> so, Father, we pray for each and every one. Lord God, you said raise them in the way they should go and that you would take care of the rest. So we commit them to you, Father. We thank you for the time that you have given these children into the hands of their parents and into our hands here as a church. It feels like a really short time because they grow up so fast. But Father, we just pray that you would bless them and that you would be with them and be near them. We pray for Jenna and her team, Lord God, and all of the nursery workers, everybody that is uh, just being with our children today, that you bless them as well, those who help and those who are helping to raise them in the great things that you have for them. Guide them and bless them, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, kids. Today we have uh, Pastor Leslie will be coming up here in a moment to uh, bring us the word. Just have a just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we know uh, I don't know if you've heard, but there's a revival uh, services that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Looking forward to those. You can pick up cards and things for those. Uh, uh, for the people that you are praying for. Uh, T-shirts are still available. Uh, so that is coming up. So make sure that you stop by and get your I've been praying for you card so you can continue to pray for who it is you are praying for, for our revival. You can get a nice, pretty pink shirt. Um, actually, no, it's not really pink. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a salmon color, right? I don't mind salmon color. I don't mind it at all. You're very observant. Uh, but next week, we have our baptisms. Uh, we had three people signed up, but about 40 of you told me you're getting baptized next week. So just like Lake Point fashion, no one likes to sign up. But we would love for you to still sign up so that we can get your name and everything down uh, so that we have a baptism uh, certificate for you. Uh, Pastor Bruce will be helping do some of the baptisms. Some of the other pastors will be helping uh, with that, so uh, I'm really looking forward to that next week. Um, uh, so you want to be a part of that? Uh, here's the number. Ready? 810-283-4567. You can actually put it up here. That instead of putting uh, LPCC, though, put baptism in, and it will automatically sign you up. So that's the number. Just leave that up there for a few seconds, everybody, and then uh, type in baptism. You can get the notes from that same one if you want to be a part of that. But as, long, as far as I know, uh, Jesus didn't tell people to sign up for baptisms. So uh, next week when we have baptism, if you decide next week, hey, I'm going to do it, we're just going to do it, right? I mean, it doesn't, have to, it doesn't matter. We'll just get your name and number and everything for that. Then the following, don't forget, there will not be service here at Lake Point. There will be two people out front handing out maps to Wildwood if you show up here at 10 o'clock. So spread the word. Get it all. We're, we're combining a service with uh, Kensington, and they will, uh, on the 21st, uh, will be joining with them at Wildwood, bringing a dish to pass, bring something to eat. And uh, there'll be bounce houses and all kinds of things for kids. And we're just going to have a potluck dinner afterward. And don't forget, we do summer services at 10, but that's going to be at 11. All the people with children said amen. Uh, so you can be there at uh, 11, and uh, we'll be over at Wildwood. We'll give more information uh, next week, too, and have maps and everything ready uh, for you uh, for that. And then the following week, we will have... Um, uh, Peter Warren will be back again speaking as our guest speaker after the revival services. So he will be here on that last Sunday of the month, the 28th. Yes, some of you are very excited. Um, and now at this time, I'm going to call up Pastor Leslie to go ahead and bring the word this morning. Can we welcome her as she comes? 
So while she's here, before she gets into it, I just want to point out, Pastor Leslie has started this year uh, as our family life pastor, and she has done an amazing job as our family life pastor. So I just want to thank her publicly about the great job that she's doing. Pastor Leslie, all yours. Well, thank you. I wasn't expecting that, gosh. Um, so there are notes in the app, and there are notes on paper. If you need those, you can raise your hand if you didn't pick one up. And also, if you're visiting, you can also text that to, and put in LPCC and get the notes that way. I did it right at the beginning because I will forget. So um, today we're going to talk about the communion union. And one of the things that I love to do is have people over for dinner. I especially like to have people over for dinner in the summer. One, because if it's a little cooler than it is right now, we can eat on our deck, and the deck is my favorite room in our house. And Dave does all the cooking. He smokes either ribs or brisket or something like that, and we eat with you know, farm fresh corn on the cob and sit and talk. It, there's something about sharing a meal with somebody where you can really get to know somebody, even be a little bit vulnerable. And that's what it's like to come to the communion table. Remember, the first time Jesus served communion was at the Last Supper, and he was having a meal with his disciples. Now, we get into a routine, and we think about communion. We do it every month, and sometimes we might forget how special it is and the significance of it. Uh, years ago, our youngest, she's now 23, she was seven or eight, and she was not happy that she had to come into big church because she wanted to be at kids church with Pastor Bruce. Even when we explained that Pastor Bruce was also in big church, she was not happy. And I leaned over and I said, but honey, you get to take communion. And she said, I did that last month. Why do I have to do it again? <laughs> now, shout out to Pastor Bruce that kids were that excited to be there. And also want to point out that Miss Jenna, who now runs our children's ministry, is a year older than my Hannah. So she is part of that lineage, that legacy of what Pastor Bruce put in. So can we just thank Bruce and Jenna? <laughs> So needless to say, when I got home with our Hannah, Dave and I had an ongoing conversation. So the next month, she had a little better understanding of what communion really means. Our verse today, section of scripture today, is Revelation 3, 14 through 20. And oftentimes, we look at a section of this uh, part of scripture and think it is for evangelism, when in reality this was written to the church. So follow along as I read this. To the church of Laodicea, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich and I have acquired wealth and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from my gold, from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. 
to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen. Now, this is definitely a rebuke, but it's also the promise of revival. Notice that in verse 20, when Jesus says, let me in, he doesn't say, let me in so I can shame you and guilt you. He says, let me in so we can share a meal. This is so significant. Now, to give you an idea of where this was, this was definitely a church. Laodicea is located in the present-day Turkey. This was a church founded, I believe, by Paul. But they had grown comfortable in what they had. All their needs were met. They had a little bit extra. They didn't need God. And Jesus was sending them a wake-up call and say, I'm right here. Are you paying attention? I'm knocking. The word lukewarm that we see here means indifference, clouded by self-conceitedness or self-delusion. It kind of means I got it all together. Now, we don't do this on purpose. I don't do this on purpose. But there are times when I'm coasting through life and doing pretty well. And we forget to open the door. So let's take a look at verse 20 and really analyze what Jesus is saying here. So again, he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. God bless you. So the first thing he says or the, that I want to pull out of this is anyone who hears. So if we are listening for that knock on the door, it means that not only that we hear it, but we perceive it and we understand its significance. Once we hear him knocking, we then have to take action. We have to open the door. So if we hear, that means we know he's there. And two, we have to take action, or it requires our action, and we have to open that door. But then he says, I will come in and eat with you. Some versions say sup, some versions say dine. And, you know, you can come in and you can do a quick meal where you shove the food down. You know, sometimes like if you've got somewhere to go in the evening, you eat, 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 or you're standing on the counter and you run out the door and you go on to the next thing. That is not what he's talking about here. To eat here means I will make him to share in my most intimate and blissful discussion. Really think about that. Jesus wants to spend intimate time with you. Not only is it revealing everything in him, it's revealing everything in you. And that's a good experience. It's joyful. It's blissful. It is the most precious meal you will ever share. In this process of opening that door and sharing that meal, we develop a rapport with Jesus. And when we come to the table together, we develop a rapport with each other. And that coming together every month develops unity in this body because it's centered on our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what every person that comes to table shares. When we develop that rapport, we are revived. And revival is when there is an improvement in our condition or a strength of something. 
I don't know about you, but when I think like I'm thinking ahead to the revival services and I think of an old fashioned revival, I think of gospel music and people yelling and falling on the ground and all sorts of stuff. But revival is an internal thing. Now, just to make sure you're all paying attention, put your hand on your heart. If somebody next to you is not doing it, just you know, nudge them a little bit. Put the other one up. You can close your eyes and just say, revive me, Jesus. Oh, revive me, Jesus. I open the door. Revive me. Now, you can take your hands down. This is a cyclical process. That's why we do this every month. Some churches do it every week. Some of us, I need to do it every day. Because we need to be revived daily. So why do we repeat the sacred act of communion? What happens when we meet Jesus at table? Well, the first thing is we get clean. It's a nice, refreshing shower. When I come to Jesus, like, I love the way Pastor Jesse said it today during communion. If there's anything that comes to mind, anything you need to let go, Jesus will come and he will wash that away and it is a done deal. Now in 1 Corinthians 11, 20, it sa- 8, it says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now this comes Paul is writing to the church in Corinth because the Corinthians had kind of gotten away from what they'd been taught. They were getting together and they were sharing table, but some of them were getting drunk on the communion wine and others were gorging on the food that was served. And then other people, if they didn't contribute, weren't being fed at all. And um, Paul said, "Uh, excuse me, but no. And he was telling them to examine themselves. Why are you here? So when we come to get clean, we remember we're coming to say to Jesus, thank you again. Clean me of that stuff and help me be united with my church. And Ezekiel promised and prophesied this in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. I will, not I hope to, not maybe, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow me, my decrees, and be careful to keep my laws. So that heart, even in a month's time, even in a week's time, sometimes in a moment, can get hard again. So we represent it to Jesus and say, clean it, soften it, make me more like you. So the first thing we get when we come to table is we get clean. The second thing we get is what he promises in verse 20. And that is that blissful intimacy. So we develop intimacy. This year, you know, the fall, we had a lot of community things that happened that were painful. We had church-wide things that happened that were painful. And personally, on Christmas Day, I lost my sister. On January 9th was her funeral. I was able to speak at her funeral And it was weird. It was like, I almost didn't understand why people were crying because I had cloistered myself in and wouldn't go to the reality of it because I knew I had to get up in front of people and speak. After that responsibility was done, I then started to face the reality of the loss. Honestly, I don't remember a lot of January and February. I do remember one portion, though. Every time I would go to Jesus to talk with him, I like to imagine myself in the throne room. 
I see Jesus on the throne. His majestic presence is overwhelming. And depending on why I'm going to him, I was usually at his feet, maybe at his side, even on his lap. But this time, what I was envisioning is something I'd never seen before. It was this little wooden table over to the size, about the size of a card table. And I could see it so clearly. And I was sitting in a wooden chair at this wooden table, and Jesus was over here, and I was facing this way. I had my journal open, I had my Bible open, I had my colored pens, because who doesn't love to journal with colored pens? And I'm sitting there waiting, and I kept asking, why did this happen? Where are you in this? When is this pain going to go away? How do I process what happened to me? I don't understand. Tell me, tell me, tell me. And if I turned and looked at him, I could see his mouth moving. But my grief was so loud, I couldn't hear him. So it was at that point that I knew that I needed a little help. So I started grief counseling. And I told my counselor about the situation. And I said, I don't know what to do with this. I am a pastor, and I can't hear Jesus. That's a bit of a problem. And she said, maybe it's not your season to hear. Maybe it's your season to be. And so I started every day in the afternoon. I would put on worship music anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours. And I would sit in the music. Sometimes I would turn it off. And I would picture myself in the throne room. And I would just sit. After a couple of days doing this, I was back at his feet. Within a week, I could lean on his knees. And then finally one day, I felt it was safe enough to crawl back up on his lap. And I sat in my mind in his lap with my ear to his chest and just listened to his heartbeat. And every single time, I fell asleep. I was not sleeping during this time. This was the only peaceful sleep that I had. And this was what Jesus meant to me in this season about having intimate and blissful discussion. Sometimes, no words are needed. So during those seasons, I let him hold me and I reminded myself that it was a safe place. And I reminded my intellect that I didn't need to know why or how or when or what. And I could just be. Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says, Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. That translation, Abba, Daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but you are God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also his heir. When we come to communion table and we get clean and we wait and we say, come in Jesus for that intimate time, it's because we are God's child. Fully, wholly accepted and it is a secure and safe place. So we get clean and we develop intimacy. Number three is we have a surrendered heart. We give it all to him. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. It was Pastor Bob who taught me the significance of this verse and the significance of revisiting this verse because as living beings, as living sacrifices, we crawl off that altar and want to go on and do our own thing. But instead, we re-surrender to him. 
And although, yes, you can do that once a month, I would suggest you do it daily. I just went to a secured, uh, security, I just went to a conference called Speak Up, and this is for speakers and for writers. And one of the writers, one of the keynotes, just wrote a book saying, my yes is on the table. And this woman has been a missionary all over the world, and she just returned from Ukraine. While she was in the Ukraine, she went from camp to camp. She is a certified social worker, so she was ministering to people as she went through, but she also went there to bring the love of Jesus Christ. One of her experiences was she ministered to a woman who had never heard the gospel before, which blows my mind. Ministered to her, ministered to her children, they accepted Jesus, and then she left and went on to the next camp. The next day, that camp was bombed, and everyone there died. That woman had known Jesus for less than 24 hours, and then she went to his arms. And that is because this other woman said yes. This beauty of the surrendered heart drives unity because our surrendered hearts put all of us on an even playing field. Young and old, we work together, submitted to Jesus because it becomes about others and not about me. It becomes about others and not about me. One of my passions and one of the driving things that I'm bringing to the family life ministry, because I feel this is what Jesus has called me to be, is to change Lake Point from a church of the generations to an intergenerational church. And that means our little ones not only know their older people there, but they know them by name. Um, in the fall, we'll be doing a middle school class, and one of the weeks will be an adopt-a-grandparent. I hope some of our seniors will go and join them in class that week. You'll get an interview. With, you'll be paired up with kids. You'll be interviewed. It might be for that one time. Who knows? Maybe this will start a relationship for the rest of your lives. I love these kids in the kids' church. Working with them at VBS was a joy. I sat here, and, and almost all of them that walked by me were like, That's so cute. Um, but they, again, they're not the future church. They are the church. And we need to know them, we need to love on them, and we need to build a relationship with them. That surrendered heart, I went off a little tangent, sorry about that, but that surrendered heart that we daily give over to him abolishes the lukewarm heart. So we go to communion table to get clean, to develop intimacy, to surrender our hearts, and finally to be sent. To be sent means to say yes before you know where you're going. Let me say that one more time. To be sent means to say yes before you know where you're going. Years ago, we had a prayer meeting. It was a week of prayer, and it was in uh, Burgess Hall, and there was only about six, maybe eight of us there that night. And one of the scripture verses that was read is Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who sh whom shall go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. I said that as a prayer that night, having no idea that would mean I would end up here. If I knew it then, I would have run the other way. I'd have been old Jonah. Get me out. But God has a plan and God equips you as you move forward in your yes. He also oftentimes doesn't want you to know where you're going because most of us would run the other way. So I'd like to invite the band to come out. A um, couple weeks ago, well, about a week and a half ago, we went up to the UP for a weekend away. 
the weekend started, and I'm not going to go into the details, but just know that our personal kayaks flew off the back of the car on, the, on I-75. Nobody was hurt. Kayaks were hidden. Bill and Dave went back up a week later, got the kayaks back. God is gracious in keeping those hidden. But it was a little nerve-wracking. And after the week, the year I've had, my fight or flight gets triggered really fast. And I have to stop, and I have to breathe, and I have to go back onto Jesus' lap and say, it's okay, everything's fine. We're on vacation. <laughs> so we were supposed to go kayaking um, on Pictured Rocks, at the Pictured Rocks with a tour. And it was supposed to be Sunday. We moved it to Monday because the weather looked bad. They canceled Monday because the waves were too high. Tuesday was booked, so we finally couldn't go until the very last day we were there, which was Wednesday morning. And I did not know how to pray because I'm thinking, if the waves were too high to kayak, I could die. I'm not sure I want to do this. And so I prayed like, okay, whatever you want, Jesus. I know Dave wants to go. <laughs> So I'm going to go. <laughs> we got there, and the first thing they do is go through the safety checks and tell you all the things that could go wrong. <laughs> yeah. And then you have to take and you have to put on a, uh, uh, a splash guard thing, and it goes on up over your waist, and you strap it in. And then that, when you get into the kayak, straps onto the kayak so you're sealed in. And you have on a safety vest. So, I, you know, and they're all one size fits all. So I'm like moving like this because I can't see. Get into our kayak. I see the little thing on the front so I know if we tip over, I have to pull it off so I can swim away. And I kept going through that in my mind. And I'm in the front. Dave is in the back because it's a double kayak. That means Dave has all the control. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and every time he moved the kayak, the kayak went like this, right? But it felt like it was going, hua, hua. and I'm like, okay, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And as we, I learned, and I started to get in rhythm with the way Dave was paddling, and I could feel how the boat was moving, I started to trust the boat, and I trusted my husband. Now, he could talk, and I could hear him, but when I tried to talk, because I couldn't turn around, he really couldn't hear me. So we continued on for the two hours of this tour. It was five miles of kayaking. It was the most blissful, beautiful nature experience we have shared together and I'm very thankful for it. But I tell you about it because this is exactly what it's like to ride along with Jesus. You're in the front, he's your rear guard. You have to do your part, put your energy into it, but he's steering. And when you do that, you are safe. So let's pray and then I'll have you stand with band. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus to us. Thank you that we have his words when he shared communion with the disciples. Thank you that we are cleaned by him. Thank you, Lord, that when we come to him, we have intimate, blissful discussion. Thank you, Lord, that you allow us to re-surrender to you. And thank you, Lord, that you send us so that we may extend your kingdom and share in your glory and your honor. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with the band.
He is an amazing God, isn't he? He's an amazing God. I've studied a lot about gods and different uh, uh, religions and everything like that. But what amazes me is that the God of the universe, the creator of it all, as Pastor Leslie said, wants to spend time. I, I can think of 100,000 actors and actresses in Hollywood who don't want to spend any time with me. But they have got nothing on the creator of it all who wants to be with me and dwell within my heart. We have to realize how amazing our God is. He created the planet. He created you. <laughs> and he wants to be with you. My favorite line of, of, of her message is, is reading that scripture, we are heirs. We inherit the things of our creator. Wasn't that a great message for us today? Thank you, Pastor Leslie. Such a great message. Revival begins in us. So, Father God, this morning, we just want to worship you and we want to thank you for all that you have done. How you want to be with us and be near us. Father, let that be something that revives us in this time. Let us not be like Laodicea that had it, that were there, that missed their moment because it was inward focused and not outward focused. They didn't bring you in. They thought they had it. Father, let us never be a people. Let us never be a church that thinks, well, we finally arrived. Let us have an insatiable thirst for the things of your spirit, I pray. I pray that you would go with us, you'd go before us, you'd be beside us, you'd be behind us, you'd go with us. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. I pray that you would bless us and that you would keep us and that you'd make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. You'd lift up your countenance and give us your peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. If you're new today and you'd like to meet with me, I'll be out here at the Orange Table. Otherwise, we will see you right back here next week. It's an outdoor service. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Go with God. Undeniable
Change. It's clear to me you're here with me. Got you are undeniable. <laughs> 